Good evening, everyone. Buju Inanam, Julia Lafreniere and Indigenous Cause, Camperville, Dunji, Treaty 4 Territory, Nibaba, Joel Lafreniere, Indigenous Cause, Wagush Dodem. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Julia Lafreniere. My family is from the Metis community of Camperville, Manitoba, located on Treaty 4 territory. I'm a member of the Stony Point Local for MMF. And professionally, I'm the head of Indigenous initiatives at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. I'd like to acknowledge that the Winnipeg Art Gallery is located on Treaty 1 territory. The Nahiawak and Anishinaabe were signatories to that treaty. The WEG is located on the homeland and the birthplace of the Métis Nation, as well as the unceded territory of the Sioux Confederacy, which was the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota nations. And it is also on the unceded territory of the Dene nations, which means they didn't enter into treaty agreements with Canada. However, the territory is still their homeland. The WEG is home to many Inuit artwork. And the collection is both permanent and on long-term loan from the government of Nunavut. And I take the role of the spiritual care of these artworks very seriously, as I recognize that they are not on their homelands. And until they return, I care for the spirit of these artworks in the proper ceremonial way with feasting and prayers with elders. There would not be an Inuit art center or Kalmayuk without those artworks. So I'm grateful to them and their makers. So I begin by saying all these things because Canadians cannot continue to be ignorant to the reason we are able to live and exist on these lands today. And that is due to the original caretakers, the indigenous nations of the territories. And the reason the Winnipeg Art Gallery is able to exist is due to the indigenous nations that cared for the lands and waters for centuries. So we cannot forget those things and we must actively work to deconstruct these systems in our lives every day so I encourage everyone to think about the ways we maintain the status quo in our lives and therefore perpetuate the systemic racism in Canada and think of ways that you can disrupt the status quo. So Métis Kitchen Table Teachings is a virtual series dedicated to the transmission of Métis knowledge and culture. Uh, the virtual series is presented alongside the exhibition Heartbeat of a Nation, Métis Women 250 Years by artist Tracy Fair. And I'll put a link to that in the chat here. It's open until November 20th and the Winnipeg Art Gallery is free for indigenous people. So I would encourage everyone to come and see that exhibition. This is the second last event in the Métis Kitchen Table teaching series. Uh, the next and last one will take place next Wednesday with Dr. Chantal Fiola. And I will put a link to that in the chat as well. And it's about Red River spirituality beyond the stereotypes. So it is my absolute pleasure to highlight Métis voices through this programming series. Uh, and the WAG is very grateful to all the Métis people involved for their partnership and the sharing of their knowledge. So we will have a question and answer period at the end of the discussion. And I'll be reading questions from the chat box. So you can put your questions there if you like. Um, we might not have a chance to get to everyone's questions depending on how many we get, but um, we will do our best. So uh, we'll now get into the discussion and it is my pleasure to welcome William Benoit and I will let you introduce yourself. Hello, my name is William Benoit. I am also a citizen of the Red River Métis, citizen of the Métis Nation. I was uh, born in the Métis Parish of St. Boniface and raised in the northern part of the Parish of St. Norbrook. My people are the Lejmudière, the Marians, the Riels, uh, the Goulet, um, all the street names that uh, we get annoyed when we drive down um, the streets in Winnipeg. Currently, I live in Ottawa, and I am the advisor for internal Indigenous engagements. Uh, my background is history, and it's also Indigenous uh, genealogies. I was one of the individuals that worked at the very beginning to determine what was considered sufficient and adequate and uh, comprehensive enough to determine um, whether the Manitoba Métis Federation would consider an individual 
for uh, a Métis card. So I'm very familiar with the material we're talking about because uh, Métis script documents uh, play an important part in uh, identifying the Métis people. Right. So we had discussed a little bit this afternoon about um, storytelling and the non-linear way of, um, I guess, responding to certain questions, which I, I think is really important. I find sometimes when I have these discussions, uh, panel talks uh, with Indigenous knowledge keepers that oftentimes uh, some of the viewers, they, they don't like the way in which the knowledge keeper is responding to the question because they do it in a roundabout way. And you articulated that really well this afternoon. And I'm wondering if you can repeat that for the people this evening. Anyone who knows me will know I'll never say anything exactly the same way twice. So I'm hoping I'm getting to the point. What is key about the storytelling tradition within the Métis community, and we see it as well with our First Nation cousins, and I have noticed it as well with the Inuit, is that we speak in a circular fashion. So there is always stories, little stories that are told in little circles, and the little circles don't necessarily start at the beginning and don't necessarily go to the end. Uh, the dominant population prefers what we refer to as a linear uh, discussion, a linear way of doing things, and they expect a very fancy articulate introduction summary, a very linear line, maybe a little bit of an anticlimax near the end. And when they conclude, there is this fantastically obvious and blunt uh, conclusion. Uh, I always say that that's not active listening. Our elders taught us to listen to their stories and over time, as we enjoyed our elders, the elders would tell us little pieces of stories that as we got older and we got better at understanding, we would see that these collections of stories actually tell us what we need to know. So a conversation you have with an elder today has an impact on how you appreciate what the elder says tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So I also noticed something over the years working in Ottawa where I completely antagonize the dominant population is that most Indigenous people, and all the men in my family do this, is you never answer a question with a blunt answer. So to use a crude example, do you like bananas? In my family, people will not say yes or no at the beginning. They'll start with the uh, I like them because they're colored. I like them because they're easy to peel. I like them because they're sweet. Yes, I like bananas. Uh, whereas within the non-Indigenous population in Canada, they work on the style of, yes, I like bananas because. And what is most interesting when you listen to elders speak or people who have an Indigenous speech pattern is that we all expect to be taken along that story, that arc of what interests people. That's the cyclical, the cyclical comment I made first. We, we, we get, we're carried along to get to our answer. Right. They may not officially articulate the answer, but we're carried there. Yeah, and I had noticed that this different way of storytelling um, has not exactly meshed in the past. So I thought it was really important that we address that um, at the beginning. Um, so, and put words to it. And you did that so nicely earlier. So thank you for uh, framing the discussion in that way. Okay. No problem. It's my, my brothers, well, they themselves ask me if I'm going to get to my point, but <laughs> fundamentally they, they know this. Yeah. Um, so I was going to, to start about the script. I should point out that I purposely sat at my dining room table so that I would be part of this discussion in the manner of which uh, it's to be presented. What is important about the conversation for me at a table is that it's not heavily laden with scientific words or heavily laden with uh, facts and figures. So what you'll find about my conversation today is that I'll give you the narrative, but then I challenge people if they're interested to go forth and find out if my guesstimate of what the number might be, or if I'm saying it was a lot, um, I challenge people to go forth and find out exactly what that number is. 
Um, so I wanted to say that. So if there are individuals here that are expecting me to say 6.2% of something, it's not my style. I'm much more of a, a grand narrative person. So I wanted to say that. It also is the realm of the professors to speak that way. Mm -hmm. And if anybody's really interested, there is a professor based out of the University of Alberta called Professor Frank Tuff, who has spent decades and decades studying Métis script. And his office and his team uh, are very, very interesting. And they've worked through a lot of the things that I'll tell you today. So, so let's what, just start sorry, with generally. Yeah. yeah, let's just start really generally. So what is script? Script. Um, I'm going to step back a bit with the, his, the history. What okay. happened in 1763 when the British took over uh, this region they created a document called the Royal Proclamation. And the Royal Proclamation has a section in it that says how, as they uh, are going to control North America, because now the French are theoretically gone, uh, that they would uh, control the region. So they set up rules on how to interact with indigenous people. Um, sometimes the Royal Proclamation of 1763 is called the Indigenous Magna Carta because it sets out the, the rules for playing or interacting with Indigenous people. So move ahead to um, Manitoba, Northwest Territories, 1869, 1870, the Canadian government wants to purchase um, the North, uh, the property of the Hudson's Bay Company. But they have to follow the rules set out in, in the uh, Royal Proclamation. What happened was the First Nations peoples of the region uh, were, were put under treaty. I'm going to put it that way. They, they negotiated treaties, and we all understand what treaties are, so I'm not going to go, go there today. But the Métis were more problematic because we were considered not a collective, so we had to be taken care of on a piece of land somewhere, as we now know, wasn't necessarily as productive as it could be. Uh, what we were told is that they wanted to create a process whereby we, uh, as individuals, would um, be compensated for um, the loss of our sovereignty in the region. So we were, um, as the expression goes at the time, giving up our Aboriginal title to the region so that, so that the British crown or the Canadian crown, depending on the period in Canadian history, um, would, uh, would have control over us. So for the Métis, they created a system called scrip. And in simple words is at the end of the day, Métis per people for their, their Aboriginal title were supposed to get land. And later on, when there were complications and the land that they wanted to put aside and, and so that they could keep what they were giving to the train companies and keep what they were going to give to white settlers, what they did is they started to give cash. So what happens is there is a coupon process. At the end of the day, you got a coupon that was either a coupon to get land or a coupon to get cash. So complicated processes. Remember, this is a government. Governments always like things that are complicated, particularly when it comes to forms. So the average Métis family had to go to a location. And in the Red River, it was easier because the locations were close to us. But if you were in Saskatchewan, Alberta, you could travel for miles to go to a place where the government officials were. And you'd fill out a form. And you would declare to them in this form that I am a Métis person and I have a right to either land and later cash uh, and or cash um, as uh, to agree to Canada taking sovereignty over you. So we have the go there and that was cool, difficult because you have to remember most people didn't necessarily speak English. They didn't write. They didn't know what was being written on these forms that uh, that they were they were talking about these these applications. Then the applications were 
sent to Ottawa or sometimes in the region and they decided if a person qualified. If they qualified, they got a letter. If they got a letter, then they had to get the lawyers involved. Think Indian residential schools, survivors, and all the lawyers issues that they had. And they'd get the banks involved. And then hopefully at the end of the process, they received what almost looks like a government check. Um, they call it a script coupon. And that coupon would say how much money they were getting. No, I'm saying this now, but if um, a brother and sister were sharing their mother's share, they might get $80 each. But if the mother had been still, still living, she would have gotten 160. So when we talk about the script coupons, they actually have different dollar value on them, depending how many individuals had a right to that money. Um, this is particularly important because the script process in Manitoba was started in 1717, yeah, sure, uh, 1873, um, and it took about 10 years. So sometimes by the end of the process, um, an individual may have died, particularly children, because of the fact that children uh, in that period had high mortality rates or higher mortality rates than we have now. So when we talk about this process, and this is the part that I don't think we should talk about too much today, is that when the Métis were involved, we have a situation whereby we had people around us as we were doing this, where they would take advantage. So we talk about land speculators and corruptions at the bank and some of the founding fathers of the dominant white society would uh, profit from um, these monies. And that's the easiest conversation to find when you look the word up script in Google, Wikipedia, or, or go somewhere more scholarly, is there's always a discussion uh, how did the Métis lose this land? Did they do it uh, because they were stupid, uh, ill-informed, Ill Ill or, or what the reason? There's, it's interesting because it's scandal. So uh, I leave that to, to everyone. I want to tell one story, however, because it's pertinent to the territory that you uh, are currently living on and the one that I'm, I'm born into, is that script as a process was supposed to be shared with all of the children um, that were coming up so that they would have a head start before all the white settlers arrived. So they were supposed to get a share of $1.4 million, um, $1.4 million, $1.4 million acres. And so what happened is, is that for good or bad reasons, that didn't happen. One of the reasons was that they couldn't count the number of children which I find is really funny because in 1870 in Manitoba, in the census, there were about 12,000 people uh, in Red River, of which 10,000 were Métis and 7,000 were children. But at the end of the day, after they closed down the, the files for the postage stamp province Manitoba, there was just under a thousand children that received nothing because they had messed up the counting of the children, my mind says four times. And for those that love conspiracy theories, I'll say that we know it's about a thousand children because the MMF, the Mental Media Federation, uh, went looking and did research and realized that there were children that never received anything, which is what the Métis had always said. You didn't complete this effectively. So people go, well, how do you know? How do you know? But whoever actually destroyed the files were not efficient. So there is a big ledger book. You know, in the old days, they print pages. And then when they got enough pages filled, they put it in a, in a le leather spine and a big hard cover. There is one of those indexes in Ottawa that actually lists, I can't remember the number, uh, somewhere around 970 uh, names of Métis children who never actually received anything. But the file is funny because it'll say, and to use one of my ancestors, uh, children of LZR, Legimodier, and Sarah Goulet. And they'll list my namesake, William Legimodier, his sisters, and it'll move on to the next household, which is um, their cousins and then their neighbors down the list. And there are 970 children in this book. 
The file gives the, the children's names, their birth dates, and gives the file number, but the files don't exist. So we know that the files were created. The people actually went to the, uh, to the, to this, uh, the script commission and said, oh, by the way, these are the names of my children. And this was a complicated process because they had to um, prove who they were. They had to prove the birth dates if the records existed. Um, they had to get people in the community to, uh, to confirm by oath that yes, they knew the individuals and they knew that the information that they were giving. I think the word we use in legal terms is these are attestations. Somebody was saying that yes, indeed, this is true. As an aside, those attestations are really interesting because uh, most people don't look at that first page. And I think we have some script material in a minute, but those pages that I'm speaking to are not there. And what they'll do is they'll say, we acknowledge and we know the Métis individual who's filling out this form. So we know Sarah Goulet, who this form is filled out for. And then you see who is there. And what I find is really interesting is it's not the mayor of the town. It's not the, you know, the judge. It's not fancy people. It's their cousins, their neighbors, their brothers, their sisters. So even in a simple little page, it's showing the kinship structures. So you can tell who knows who. It's interesting to look at Luriel's script affidavit to see which of his cousins stood up for him when the form was being filled out or who filled out, um, say, Julia, your ancestors' forms, because it tells something about the community that they live in. Uh, notice there a little bit of a circle that I did. I just wanted to draw attention to it just to reinforce an earlier point. So maybe so, I'll share my screen here. Is this a good Sure, one? go ahead. So with these forms, there were 11 commissions. They did Manitoba first, and then they did 11 different commissions. They, uh, after Manitoba, they traveled around at the same time they were doing the treaties. So there was one tent, and I'm making up this, this image in my brain, so but, but walk with me. So there was a tent that said, this is where the First Nations have to go um, to uh, get registered uh, at, under treaty. Then there'd be another tent at the same time, uh, which were always called the, the script commissions. And what they would do is they'd fill out forms. And in these forms, they would identify information. I wanted to point out this first one on the screen is for the second commission. So this one was designed for the region outside of uh, the postage stamp. Uh, in this particular case, it's Duck Bay. And it has the statement right at the beginning that it declares that Baptiste Chartrain, and they interestingly enough tell us what his, his first nation name, the, the name he went by. Uh, I'm not gonna attempt to say it. Uh, those that are better uh, with indigenous languages, I. I challenge you to figure it out. Yeah, well, also, it's also probably the, the white settlers interpretation of what they were saying. Exactly, so exactly. Who really knows, have to figure that out. So what happens in this document is it's pretty clear. He's declaring that he is a half-breed living in the Northwest Territories and has a family. So in this particular document, he says where he was born, when he was born, who his mother and father are, and I should point out, here it says his father is Paul, Paul Chartrand. Paul Chartrand, if I'm not mistaken, this one in this generation is white. So he's the, the aged voyageur. And I can assume this because um, Baptiste is born in 1810. So he's 60 when, um, or 63 when he filled out this form, or even later. I don't know the date on this form. Um, he's saying that Lizette uh, it was an Indian woman. So this is his mother. So this is the strong indication that, um, and this is the legal definition of Métis. So when we talk about being Métis nation versus uh, an Eastern Métis or somebody who finds an indigenous ancestor and then uses the term Métis, every Métis of the Métis nation proved back to one of these documents. Uh, so it's interesting. So in this particular case, and we won't read it through all the way, but what happens is that he tells you where he lived when he moved around, he had to tell them that he was in the Northwest Territories at a certain date, so he qualified. He wasn't living in Hawaii or he wasn't you know, somewhere where he shouldn't be uh, when they were doing this paperwork. And then later on, they list all the children. 
And so that's kind of cool. And then there's other questions that I'll, I'll leave people to read to when they go through this later. Could you flip to the next one, Julia? So what happens is in these documents uh, is that uh, sometimes, depending on where you live, and this is be the Duck Bay area where we know today there is also a First Nation, is that sometimes the forms will tell us that they are choosing to be defined as Métis and not being defined as First Nation. So this particular document that doesn't tend to happen in Eastern Manitoba, but it happens as we go West, where they're saying, I'm identifying as a Métis, I don't identify as being First Nation. So here's a clear statement that Baptiste has said that he, um, that, that he considers himself Métis. I always tell people to, to amuse themselves with the signatures on the bottom, because if nothing else, uh, we find out who are the friends, who are the neighbors, um, who are the allies. So in this case, we know from the Duck Bay area, there are Giboshes, and we know that there are Demeray. And here it looks like Demera, as in the sugar, but I never surprised with spellings. I wanted to point out something that maybe I should say later, but is very important to me, is those X's. When we think that these are illiterate people, um, or that's what we're supposed to see when we see the X, is that this may be the only time in this man's life that he actually stood before some type of a tribunal and made his mark. I think to me that's quite powerful, even though it is a mark. And in some of them, as we go through them collectively, we're not gonna see them all today, you will see how unsteady the hands are. And in those rare occasions that we actually see them written, they are beautiful things because you see the man or the woman standing in front of a committee, making their mark. So it's just not somebody else is saying that they're a half breed, but what they're doing is they're saying it themselves and they're signing it. So in that sense, it, it's, it's quite a, a beautiful thing. Can we flip to the next one, Julia? So this is an example of the ones from the first generation, like first generation. These are the Manitoba postage stamp version. This is version one. And it's the one that speaks to me because it's the one where all my family are based. My people are St. Boniface, St. Norbert, Lorette, St. Anne, that, that stretch. Um, this one's probably better. So what happens is these ones give the name of the person, in this case, Ursula Lafreniere, and it says that, uh, I have to move a little forward because I'm old. Um, she is from St. Francois Xavier. And um, in the writing of Mar um, Marquette, and they've also written in that Baptiste Lafreniere farmer was the father, um, father, the husband, which is great because now we've got information that is sort of genealogical in purpose. We are looking and having truth, a story about this family that we know that they were farmers. They could have very easily said they were provisioners, they uh, worked the Red River carts, they were boatmen. We, we often see what they're doing. And from a contextual story building of the Métis, those references are significant. So we can tell what people did. It tells us who our ancestors were in that way. I'm gonna move a little further down to the statement that I've always watched people cry over or they'll stop and they'll reread. And I'm gonna read it twice. I am a half breed head of a household living in the parish of. I am a half breed. That's a very powerful statement. It's written on a white person's document, but we signed it. It's, it's who we are. It's to me the same as the, I am queer, or I'm 51% of the population, I'm not going anywhere. Um, just think of the protest statements that were on all those placards during the protest period in the 1960s. This in itself is a very powerful statement. And it's, I think, a statement that the Métis people should own. And they don't ever talk about this statement. Uh, again, like the other form that we looked at, um, it says in this case, uh, Francois Saint-Germain, French-Canadian, was my father. And uh, 
Louise uh, Soucier, half-breed, was my mother. So this is genealogical information. So this is the information that um, all Métis people need to know. It's, an, it's a statement of who we are. It's a statement that says we're Métis. It says this is where it, it shows. The Eastern Métis don't have this. They can just tell you that there's a, there is a First Nations woman somewhere in their background. This is our definition of Métis. And then in this case, Ursula signs it with an X. I wanted to point out in the gravelly bit at the bottom, um, these uh, forms are of not great quality. They were never put on great paper. They're hard to, to read at the best of times. But I want to point out what it says there at the bottom, which is important uh, when I, when I, I'll tell you why it's important. It says affidavit number, and they give a number. So Ursul is a person, but she has a number. She's not her husband's wife. Her children are not her husband's children. She is an individual here. So forever in the script processed, and I'm going to take my glasses off and lean forward again, Ursul is number 1375. So what happens throughout the, the entire process, this individual, this person uh, is uh, identified with her own number. And then underneath it, it says script number 10198, and she received $160. So we know that for her, and it says underneath that, the script was issued on a date, 21st of August, and I can't quite read the date. I'm thinking 1873 or 1878. Those are the big years that they finally got around to, um, to processing. I say that because she filled out this form in 1873. So if it was 1878, she waited five years to complete this process. That being said, we're not entirely certain if, um, if she ended up keeping it all or any of it. Because as I said, there was the process. The process worked against Métis people. If she was lucky, she was able to apply that to her own land, which she would share with her husband. But there were a lot of Métis women that owned their own property. Uh, she could use it to pay back bills. This was a period uh, of poverty. This was a period where um, people had to be very frugal. Uh, we're just coming out of a famine period. And hopefully that there was a nest egg but we can't be sure. I, you'd have to listen to the stories of the Lafreniere's to find out what actually happened to that money. You will find that every Métis family has a different story uh, about what happened. Were they cheated? Were they cheated near the end? Um, were, were they cheated early on? Um, did they sell out um, because they needed the food? So they needed the money? That was quite common. And I wanted to point out, and I know this is a point that Julia wanted me to speak to later, is that we had those script commissions, those tables where the Métis had to go to with their friends or their cousins and say, this is who I am. I am a Métis man or I am a Métis woman and I'm intending to get what is owed to me. At the same time, this process, and they knew about this process, the process said, we may give you and your children land, but we're not gonna tell you where you're gonna get it because the government said it would be a lottery. So you could be from Lorette and you, then you could get, your children could all get land in Nipawa, or you could then get another child when they're processing the file, could get their, their land near Tolstoy, Manitoba. I'm just making up examples. Uh, the Métis are, are family oriented. We, we like our families. We like to stay near our families. We like to do things with our families. When you're tight in cash and then all of a sudden you're told, where am I, where are you sending me, sending me? Where are you sending my children? Yes, my son is only six and he's not going to be able to get this until he's an adult, but do I want him so far from home? Because that's very hard to respect the nation when the nation by a government process is splitting us up. At the same time, when they were getting these documents and they weren't, weren't going to cash them in, uh, 
they have to, first of all, you get, you apply for the document. I skipped through, I apologize. You skip through, you, you get the, the, um, the application, you wait. Then it comes back with a letter saying, yes, you can have it, you qualify. There are no examples in those screens that Julia showed us where the person, um, they said no. And then what happens is then you have to wait and then you have to apply to the government saying, please give us those actual coupons. And then you wait and the coupons are delivered to a bank or a lawyer. And then you had to go into the lawyer. And when the lawyer gave them to you, then you had to um, sign a receipt to the government saying, yes, I received them. And then often that's when it gets problematic. How do you cash it in? Do you walk it to the banker in five minutes and say, give me the full $160? Or are you lucky enough to walk to the land titles office and say, I don't know where I'm going to get my, my 160 acres, but I'm going to go somewhere and actually get land. Some of the early Manitoba families were lucky that they were able to stay in Red River, but that wasn't always the case. I, um, I think that leads us uh, pretty nicely into the next question. Um, so how would you describe, or how is script used as a tool for colonization? So script being used by white society. So as white society goes, they wanted to get access to the land. So from that perspective, it was a relative, relatively cheap process because they really didn't own the land. So let's give you something that we don't physically have to pay for. Um, in the sense it'd be different as if they gave everybody a million dollars to go away. It, it's something that was a, a cheap way to buy us off, so to speak. Um, it allowed Canada to move forward its agenda to have a railroad from coast to coast. It also moved forward its agenda to, uh, to put settlers uh, into the West. I always remember a quotation from Sir John A. MacDonald, and I'm gonna bastardize it, but he basically said that he knew that they just had to wait long enough until the, the Métis were outnumbered. Because he knew full well that at some point the power we had in 1870 wouldn't last. And by creating this system where Métis had to choose to stay or go, to sell out because they need to, or to move west, um, is a very powerful tool to destroy the nation. And that to me is problematic because it was an obvious technique. In the same way, if we talk about the history of the treaties, uh, the first round of treaties with most First Nations were huge pieces of property. And then the history of their interaction between that First Nation and the government is the government slowly taking away big chunks until the least um, usable land was left and cities that wanted the land around them were able to gobble up and chew up bits around the edges. Sort of a, the same concept. The government found a way to break the spirit of the Métis Nation on the assumption that they were, what did, um, Kerche said that, he, that the system was, was the most eff effectual and equitable manner, where I would argue that the process with the, the system and what was happening, it was never effective and it was never equitable. There were people that were more successful. I'm assuming the examples of Ursul, for example, is that she finished the process. There is an indication she got something. So she was a, a better winner than a lot of the others. There are others that like the, the thousand children that never received anything. There are people who were so poor and so disadvantaged that they chose to sell often at less pennies on the dollar uh, and move away, which brings us to a term we hear a lot lately, and that's the road allowance people. So what happens is there's a people that because of how they were caught in this system, they were unable to get that head start that was promised to the Métis with the Manitoba Act in 1870. So we know stories about people living in road allowances 
or in land that nobody else wanted. Um, they weren't allowed to go to school because they didn't pay taxes. They weren't allowed to have um, the services of that community like water and uh, electricity. In Winnipeg, we have the, um, the classic example of Rooster Town uh, around Grand Park um, High School and the, uh, the mall just off the edge of Taylor. I remember walking that area as a kid. I was, I've always been a walker. Um, people think I'm freakish, but 10 to 20 miles a day is not a problem for me. And I used to walk from the St. Norbert, Fort Richmond area, and I'd walk to Kildonan Park, use their bathroom, and then walk home. And you'd walk past that region. So I'm going through the old parish of St. Vital, and I'm going through the old parish of St. Charles to Cinnaboyne Park. And what would happen is that you'd walk past that stretch uh, on Taylor, where even as a child, there were a few shacks that still remained, but you could see the, the you could see where they lived. You could see where the rhubarb plants remained, where you could tell that somebody enjoyed their flowers, but their house had been torn down by the city. Because we know the history of uh, Rooster Town. It's the, it's the same story of Craig siding and, and all the other, I think there's arguably 20 or 30 of them across Western Canada where um, the, the people were disadvantaged and nobody did anything for them. And uh, it's quite sad. You can read about road allowance people uh, if you have a few moments, if you're if you're feeling strong, it's quite a, a very complicated story. Maybe you touched a little bit about it um, or mentioned it, but perhaps can you talk a little bit about the reign of terror? The reign of terror, you know, we've had this conversation lately in um, uh, the news. The, I think the expression somebody came up with, they call them the woke, the people that are all of a sudden realize that things happened and they want to tear down statues and rename schools and, and, and so forth. There's something to be said for that because there's a lot of stories that are not told, particularly because the old adage is the winners, uh, the winners write the history. After the Manitoba Act was signed, so this is the, and I'm thinking about how they word it, a solemn constitutional obligation to the Métis. And later on in the Supreme Court decision, Manitoba Métis Federation versus Canada, they refer to it as um, a document with treaty-like characteristics. So when we talk about the Manitoba Act and the, the conditions of the Manitoba Act, we're talking about a treaty-like document, an agreement with the Métis people. So that sounds lovely. You know, let's all sing hands and sing kumbaya. But what happens is that, um, when the, the, the Manitoba Act was signed and Rail's provisional government agreed to join Canada, what was happening is uh, General Garnet Wosley and his men were coming from the east and they were there to maintain order or they were there to bring civilization to Red River because we had had this rebellion resistance period. Yeah, sure. Um, I have a lot of trouble saying polite things about this period because what happened was particularly uh, because this group was made up of different type of people. They had some professional British soldiers, but they also had a lot of individuals who were part of the militias who wanted to get themselves an Indian or they wanted to beat up an Indian or they just wanted to to screw over, I apologize for my crudeness, the, um, the Métis people. So they came with an agenda. So Garnet Wosley and his militia came to Manitoba in 1870 to, to create order, but they created the complete opposite. So what happened is in that period is the Métis lived under a period of fear because particularly the militia from Ontario um, wanted to beat up Indians. And I say that loosely, but they wanted to beat up people who didn't believe in the, the whole concept of British imperialism. You know, you had to be Protestant, you had to be white, you had to be male. Um, the sun never sets on the British empire, those type of, of concepts. 
And so there are cases of um, beating up Métis people, burning their farms. There's a park in St. Boniface that we all know called El Zier Goulet Park. He'd be a, a great, 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 how many greats back uncle of mine. Um, he was in a bar in Winnipeg and having a beer or having lunch, whatever. And some of these militia saw him and they chased him to the river and they stoned him. So the Métis Nation refers to him as a patriot because all he was doing is he was trying to come home. He was trying to go someplace safe, but he didn't make it. He made the bottom of the river. And I apologize for the sadness of that. I do find since I've left and I'm living in Ottawa that Winnipeg has been smart enough to name a park along the river just yards away from where he died. My grandmother, when we used to go across the Taché Bridge when we were children, would always point out the window and say, this is where Elziar died. This is part of that storytelling tradition that we have in our communities where we, we share the information that's important. Uh, I wanted to point out, uh, I've forgotten her name this evening, but because LZR was considered a bad person because he was in Riel's provisional government, you know, there was a sign on their door, you know, make life difficult for these people. There were examples where the militia would just break into his house and threaten his women. And unfortunately, the worst part of the story is at one point they raped his daughter. So she, in my mind, is another example of a patriot of the Métis Nation, but in that reign of terror. And I say reign of terror and people will go, oh, the Métis are over exaggerating. But what it is, is it's a term that was actually coined by the newspapers in the Eastern United States as outsiders, they're watching this happen. Because you know that there's dispatches of news going from Winnipeg to Pembina, to St. Paul, Minnesota. So they know what's happening and they know it's not appropriate, but it's not their territory. So they say nothing, but they identify that there is a problem. But in the Canadian story of Red River, we don't talk about the reign of terror. There are statues to these people in Winnipeg. There's a neighborhood named after the leader who never, even though they were identified, they knew who the person was that stoned Riel, I'm uh, not Riel, stoned Elzir Goulet, they generally know the men who were, uh, that raped his daughter. They know who burned people's houses down and all these things. There was not a single case where anyone ever actually got punished, that court martial or whatever they say in military terms, because it was appropriate to beat on Métis people in this period. So I have a lot of respect for those individuals. I have respect for my, my, my ancestors who stayed in Red River. They said, we're far enough out, Lorette, Manitoba, St. Anne's, uh, Ile de Chien, you know, those areas, St. Norbert even, we're far enough out that we can protect ourselves and we can protect our families. It may not be economically fabulous, but we could protect each other. But at the same time, I understand those people that said they had enough. I have a colleague, uh, whose family we were from the St. Francois, Francois Xavier area. And they had enough. So what they did is, and she tells this story beautifully, that one day her mother started packing the Red River cart and they moved west. And they went into the, the South Bend, uh, uh, Saskatchewan River area, the St. Laurent, uh, de Grandin, Batoche area. And they started again. They took nothing with them except what they could put on that river cart. So the story in that family, and one of the most beautiful stories, and I, at some time, I hope you guys hear her tell it, uh, how that walk was for the entire summer to go from uh, Winnipeg, Red River, to, um, to Batoche um, to start again. So there are lots of stories about start again because of this reign of terror, because of the dis disadvantagedness of needing the monies, having to sell the script. Uh, do we keep it and wait to see if we'll get anything of value? Do we count our chickens now or do we wait till later? There's a whole discussion connected to that. And I always think people, when they talk about the Métis, oh, we got scared, we left, we sold out, it's our fault. We didn't make good decisions. 
I think we made a lot of really good decisions because we made decisions that were important to their families at that time. I always respect people who make hard decisions and then live with them. The Métis have lived with the decisions they've had to make. They weren't decisions that they took lightly and it wasn't necessarily decisions they took in a perfect world, but there were decisions that the environment created for them. So uh, I have great respect for our ancestors. Uh, I don't think less of people who left. I don't think people less for people that sold their script for pennies on the dollar because they needed food. I have no problems with Métis families that said, yes, our children's script uh, is coming, but I don't want them you know, two days ride away from where their mother is. These are very interesting questions connected to the script story. Yeah. Sorry, I started to get long-winded. No, that's okay. That's great. You pretty much answered the last question I have before um, we open it up for questions in the chat, but uh, I'm wondering if you can maybe talk a little bit about the diaspora of the Métis Nation, and you touched on it a bit with the reign of terror and people having to leave and move west, um, but what role did Script play in that movement west for some of the families? Well, obviously for those that were able to get some money out of the Script in Red River, they had limited money so that they could move to Montana, North Dakota, um, present day Saskatchewan, Alberta. So there's, it allowed for them to make choices. But at the same time, I find that um, they were disadvantaged in a way that seems a little bit funny. Um, funny as in weird, not funny as in ha ha. When person got script, and even if they had to go to Saskatchewan or had to go to Alberta, when they went to Alberta, they were not able to get land in Alberta for free. If you remember, this is the same period that the settlers were getting grants just because they got their arses there. But if you were Métis, you were not entitled to the settler grant. You were only entitled to script. The script was flawed. The script didn't work for those families. It didn't work at all. And so if you moved west, you had to find a way to support your family. Whereas somebody from Ontario or somebody from Sweden or wherever else they were coming from would walk into an office, say in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and say, hey, I want my free land. I should point out this is the same logic model that they um, attached to First Nations. So if they were in treaty, if they decided to leave the reserve and move somewhere else, they were never allowed to get free land, even though they were willing to become like white farmers, because the system said, you got it under your indigenous process and you weren't allowed to get um, anything uh, more. And I think that's sad because if you're making a choice to move to Saskatchewan and you want to say, hey guys, I'm here, um, can I start as a farmer? The system says no. That to me is, is, is quite telling about how the system worked against uh, individuals. Because at the same time, one group is being told no in Lethbridge and the, the next group is saying, yes, please come in and here's the free stuff. That to me is the biggest observation about how script has an impact uh, on people who are living, living, leaving. Make yeah. sense? Definitely. Uh, so we'll now we have a few questions in the chat. Sure, here. I can stay a couple minutes later. It's not a problem for me. So let's try to make my answers quick. Um, so question here, were some of the lands granted through script later removed by the government to give to new immigrants, like potentially the Mennonites? Yes, there is an argument to that. I'm not an expert in that. Um, I can speak a few years later when they created the air bases in Western Canada or they were creating military bases. Um, they, the government had a system where they felt that if Métis people and First Nations were not using land in an appropriate civilized fashion, and I'm saying that tongue in cheek, mm -hmm. using it in the way the white people would use it, then they did take it away. Um, there are examples of lands that were taken away um, not necessarily script lands, 
But when you think of communities like St. Madeline, where the government wanted to make a common pasture, so they, let's burn the houses down and kick the people out. So there are examples. I have heard stories around the Mennonite settlements, but I would suggest people read about it on their own because I may give them false information. So okay. yes, I think there is something there. Is the $160 basically $1 an acre based on yes. the section system? Yes, it was. But the moment the white people started arriving, you know, after 1870, they thought about the, the idea in 1870, they officially started it in 1873. But by 1874, 75, 76, there was these populations coming in. So what happens is land that would have been a dollar in 1870, when they calculated this, meant that children whose paperwork were processed later um, might have to pay four dollars for an acre or ten dollars an acre. I'm just making up the numbers. So if you got in early when the calculation worked, you got one dollar one acre. Later on it didn't happen and later on they realized that they couldn't get any land. That's when they started to give just money. Were there impersonators who fraudulently signed as being the Métis person with, with land rights? Yes. Um, there were people, maybe they were Indigenous themselves, but there were people that, that created situations. There's one story about a man named Sear um, who wrote to the government and said that I never received my script. And the government said yes, but he was in jail in St. Paul, Minnesota uh, on the day that he was supposedly had signed for his document but because there was a signature on the document the government didn't look into the fraud it just said sorry mr i don't think his first name was patrice uh, but mr sear would would lose out but it's funny because um the territorial government of minnesota knew that he was in jail but that didn't um, help him to try to get his money back uh what was the name of the professor you mentioned earlier that studies Frank? Frank Tough, as in he is tough, T-O-U-G-H. He's at the University of Alberta. Um, and he's done a lot of work with, with Scrip. And particularly, I think he's a, uh, a geographer. So one of the things that he's also works a lot with is in Métis river lot maps and um, where the Métis lived, how they lived and how they used the land. So there's also very interesting things there. How would one know today whether their Métis ancestor chose to keep land or receive the payout? You actually have to work the process all the way through and see if there's any indications. Um, that's about all I can say. Um, I think every case is different. Um, working through to see at the end of the day if an individual went to the land titles office and said, I have $160, could you please apply it to you know, some acres, would show he was successful. Um, if there's no record of that, there is an assumption. I know in my family, I'm really happy because the stories of the elders tell us what happened and they tell us when the government created an environment that was not conducive to letting them to keep the land that they were on. But each individual case, you'd have to you'd have to seriously do research. And I apologize for a non-answer. No, that's a good answer. Sometimes it's for the research is needed. Um, another question here. I read that Métis often lost their land for not paying taxes. Was that common? It was common in a couple of periods. Um, one period that I know anecdotally is that during World War I, when they were drafting people, the policy of the government of Canada was that farm boys were not drafted into the army. But I hear stories, particularly from the elders, and more research would need to be done, that the uh, Métis boys who were on farms in eastern Manitoba uh, were drafted. And so um, their mothers would have to attempt, or sisters have to attempt to farm. And this is pre-tractor. This is horses and so forth um, to maintain the farm. And often they didn't pay taxes. There was also at the early tax period, examples of um, properties within the city of Winnipeg that people wanted. My ancestors, the Jeantons, 
um, actually owned the property where the municipal hospitals are. I think it's called the Riverborne Center, Riverview Center. Riverview. You know, the hospital, the hospital. Yeah. Um, that whole bend in the river was Jean Toe family property. And the family stories say that they lost it to taxes. And yes, I do see when I've gone looking at tax records, it's hard to see, but the indication is, is that they couldn't keep up on their taxes. So yes, there are examples. Where can some start researching more about their Métis ancestors and scripts with no living relatives to share stories? There's two ways. One way is that if you really think you have a Métis ancestor, then what you could do, because it's required at the end run, is that you could pay for genealogy to be done at some places like um, uh, St. Boniface Historical Society on Provence. In French, it's called the, the Centre du Patrimoine. And um, that's their job, is they, they prove where the Métisness is, and then they hand a document over to the Manitoba Métis Federation and say, we think this person is Métis, do you accept them into the nation? So they're not saying they are Métis, but they will create an environment where the Manitoba Métis Nation uh, will approve it. The key thing to do um, is to try to work your family back to 1901. 1901 is the, is the census where the government really wanted to know what color you were. I always call it the color census because it identifies every Canadian at that time as red, white, black, or yellow. So what happens is that in those records, you can see behind your name if the enumerator has identified you as a colored family. So, and then later on, when they ask you what tribe you're part of, it might say things like, Cree breed, Scotch breed, French breed. So you can get an indication. And then you know, definitely as you move back, that that is a possibility and you can find script rec records then. Because remember from the 1901 census, you're wanting to look for a record that was created in the 1870s. That's a generation and a generation further back. From a, a research perspective, it's not particularly hard if you can get to 1901. I should point out one really sexist thing in that census is there was a belief that if the husband was white, that the wife, even though she might be Métis, would also be listed as the color of her husband and the children would be the color of their husband. So the best example I use for that is the former premier of, of Alberta, Premier Lougheed, whose family now admit that he was one of the uh, Métis premiers in Canada. Um, Premier Lougheed's great-grandfather was called Senator Lougheed. He was actually, for a time, the Minister of Indian Affairs. Um, he identifies his wife as white and all the children as white. So sometimes when you look at those color references, you got to say, eh, was there a little bit of cooking of the books there? And I think you have to remember that. So don't take everything you see as 100%. This is the Meiji genealogist in me. But if you followed the person to a certain point and you think that she's Meiji and you get these slightly sexist things, then it's okay. You may be right. Keep moving, keep moving back and see what you can find. Do you have any information about the Scottish Métis? There are script documents in my family, but we were disconnected from our Métis ancestors. The, the Scottish Métis or the country born, my grandmother, who is one of them, often referred to herself as a smoked Scotch. I always find that kind of very kind of like scotch and whiskey kind of image, smoked scotch. Um, yes, there are records of them. They are the same documents. So we used French examples here, but you can find McCorister's and you can find um, Logan's and you can find all of the names that were connected, not only to the Hudson's Bay men themselves, the Arcadians, the guys that worked at the forts, but a lot of that second and third generation of the Selkirk settlers married into Métis families. So names like Logan, um, McGilvery, uh, I'm just thinking of all the names in the, uh, in the city. Um, those would be Métis family names, uh, Burroughs. Um, the stories are difficult because I always say it's important to listen to our elders because once the stories are lost, they're lost. So 
I often told people when I worked in St. Boniface on genealogies is that if you prove your Métis, then you probably have to find a way to recreate what you know. And then what I challenge people to do is then to say, if my ancestor was a Métis woman living in Manitoba in 1880, by reading about other Métis people and the conditions of Métis people, what can I assume was happening to my grandmother? So what you're doing by using historical records and the stories of others is creating a narrative of who your people are. One of the prettiest documents I've ever seen in um, the Gabriel DeMond Institute in Saskatchewan is that somebody put together a list of all the women who were at Batoche. And they, they are listed as the patriots of Batoche because when we think about battles, people always traditionally mention just the men. But in this particular case, um, the women were there. The women had roles not only in the battle, but they had a role in protecting their families from the militias, from the Canadian government, making sure people were fed, uh, people were uh, treated if they were wounded. They were soldiers in the battle, just like men. And it wasn't until an individual created a list to say, these are the patriots of the Battle of Batoche, and the women are listed as women first and foremost. Secondary note is, and sometimes it's not there, who their husbands are. That's the secondary information. They are there under their maiden names as individuals. They are not their husband's property. You've got to remember that the tradition is women are always their husband's property. It's Mrs. John Smith. Um, it's the, the Smith woman. She, they, they, they don't tend to identify women as individuals. I learned a lot more about what happened to women at the Battle of Batoche just by looking at this list and hundreds of names of women that were there. And if you have an aunt or an, uh, a grandmother who was at Batoche, you can then read about what happened to the women in that region to learn your story. So in the sense of you're using the stories that have been collected from others to help you understand what happened. And that's very long-winded, but sometimes you have to contextualize your history by hoping somebody else who was there at the same time as your ancestors can tell you about it. Right, so just two more questions here. Um, one, the second last one is from me. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, the alloways. I know that a lot of wealth was generated by some of these settler families here in uh, Winnipeg. And I see you sigh. We don't have to talk about this if you don't want. No, it's, it's I'm trying to figure out how, how to okay. say this because I don't always want to attack the, the grandchildren of famous families in the, the okay. settler colony side of, of the city. The Alloways uh, ran a bank. So when I was talking earlier about you having to go through the banks twice to, um, to process information uh, about your script, to cash your script, the Métis weren't allowed to go directly to the government. You had to go through all of these, these people. Alloways, the Alloway Bank, and I noticed when I was in Winnipeg this summer, there's this lovely little alleyway between um, the Riel Bridge across the Red River into the forks that has a gateway from the, um, the original Alloway Bank. I don't remember, it's part of a yes. little treed alleyway. Yeah. Um, I just had mixed emotions. It's one of the most beautiful additions in Ottawa, uh, in Ottawa, in Winnipeg since I moved to Ottawa. But the Alloways made a lot of money. And I do know that people will say the old man Alloway that founded the Winnipeg Foundation, he wasn't involved. And I'm always a little suspicious when after the fact repeating that says, my grandfather was a good person, he never did anything wrong. Um, particularly because he was in a place that could do that. And I do realize that I saw a sign recently that said, uh, although 
the founder of the Winnipeg Foundation wasn't directly involved. They should have done better. They should ask questions about where the money for the foundation came from. But the last sentence or two was problematic for me because it said, and these are my words, not theirs, but by the way, the brother of the banker sat at one of those tables that I mentioned earlier, where he bought Métis script as the people were living, leave, living, leaving with their coupons. And I'm cynical. I believe in conspiracy theories. I'm going, he had money because he was a banker family, buying it at pennies per dollar, going ka-ching, 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 building houses on Wellington Crescent or wherever it is that they built their homes without the scruples of saying, is this appropriate? So the Winnipeg Foundation, a lot of the, the big money in cities, um, I can't think of any right off the top of my head, but I'm sure that if you looked into the, the foundations and the, the big fathers of places like Edmonton and Prince Albert or where the wealth came from in the banks. One example I use all the time is uh, Donald Smith. You know, we have Donald and Smith as two streets in Winnipeg. The man is so important. He has Donald and Smith named after the same person. And I should point out, he also has Strathcona and Mount Royal in another neighborhood also named after him because the white population thought he was a wow, great guy. You know, he's the, the last bike man CPR. But in the parish of St. Norbert during the diaspora period, he has nine farms. That's one parish. I've never actually gone through the maps because the river lot maps actually list the names of the owners. And by 1873, you can see all of the white opportunists that, that have farms. And Donald Smith is an example. Um, British aristocratic family now, he became whatever it was, an earl or a lord. Uh, at one point he was one of the richest men in the empire. Um, where did that money come from? Yes, it came from trains, but I argue it was the free land that he was able to get, or next to free land, being part of the train free land process of creating the trains as it went across Canada. But at the same time, it was the, I can buy Métis script at bottom dollar prices. So right. when we look at the white su successful families in a community, we have to remember where their money might have come from. Definitely. And that's really important for uh, me to point out as a person that works at the Winnipeg Art Gallery and dealing with, you know, some of these families, it's, it's important for me just to remind people of that when I can. Um, and then the last question here, can you recommend books or resources to read more, especially people's stories during the reign of terror? Off the top of my head, no. Um, Part of the problem about the history of the Métis is that you get, like we've seen in this whole idea of do you vaccinate or do you not vaccinate, you get people on both sides of the story. Uh, there are histories written um, about the Métis uh, by people that don't like the Métis. And traditionally those are the books, or don't understand the Métis, those are the books that our children used to get in classrooms. Um, there are magazine articles, for example, that are, are quite good, but there are also books that make us sound like we're Jesus Christ and we walk, you know, on water and we can make water into wine. So you have to be careful. Um, my response to start, and which is I would tell anyone who's starting, is um, um, Canadian Geographic magazine. Their articles are, are quite even and fair and they're usually up to date. So start there, see what they refer to, and they'll mention articles that they're referring to. Um, they're quite fair. Um, there is uh, the, used to be called the Beaver. The Hudson's Bay Foundation writes, um, writes articles for an, um, a magazine that talk about what happened within the region uh, that the Hudson's Bay had control. I think that if you punched in the Beaver magazine, uh, you would get its modern name. I just can't think of it at the moment. It's Canada's uh, history. Yeah, Canada's history, exactly. That's a good way to start, to get started. And then as you move forward 
you will find as you get expertise that you will find articles that are more detailed. At some point when you read about script, you will get the articles by Mr. Uh, Frank Tuff that I mentioned earlier. Um, you'll also get people that hate me too that will tell, tell them that, you know, what happened to us was our own fault and we should just be quiet. So as you get to learn about what you're reading, you'll realize when somebody's wacko and when somebody isn't. I've also got some recommendations uh, in the chat for the Northwest is our mother as a resource potentially. Yes, that's Jean Taye's book, and it's a really good book. She's one of the old cousins. She's a real uh, yeah. descendant. Right. Um, so I think that concludes our discussion this evening. So I'd just like to thank you for sharing your knowledge with us here this evening. I've certainly learned a lot, and I think my favorite takeaway from the conversation is um, how you reframed how I see the X on the documents. I had always, you know, sort of thought these, they didn't read or write or understand English and they didn't know what they were signing. But um, I like the way you framed it, that they were proud to declare who they were. And this is a symbol of that. So thank you for that. No problem. I believe that so many negative documents, if we think about them with a different lens, we can, um, we can own them. They're ours. And exactly. Happy research. Thank you. Thank you. Miigwech. Have a good evening.